Hello NextConf. I wonder if you're deploying more than you need to. In this talk, we're going to think about whether or not you are, and whether there's something that we can do about that. For someone like me, who started their web development career working with monolithic data-based applications like Drupal and Django, working with React was a little bit disconcerting. React has some amazing patterns and practices around state, around component life cycles and tree shaking and re-rendering and all that amazing goodness, but the data wrangling, everything that comes before those steps, before it gets to our application, well, those steps are left largely up to us as developers. React takes control of our, our front end and we're left with our back end to do with whatever we want. Building a tool like Johns Hopkins COVID dashboard would relies on a lot of data fetching and processing a lot of data points. We need to query the data, possibly from multiple sources, um, some of them proprietary, so we need to provide our secret API keys to be able to access those uniquely. And once we have the data, we're going to need to parse it. We're going to need to make it readable to exclude unnecessary information to get it in the right form and to carry out any complex calculations we might want to do to, uh, so that our users can not have to do those themselves. And once we've done all that, we're going to cache those results so that every request that comes to our web server isn't having to do that over and over and over again. At that point, the data gets to our React app. We render our components based on the data. We update our components based on our user interactions. And up until now, we have used custom servers to do that grunt work, to do that data wrangling. There are other reasons custom servers are useful, right? We can use them to um, create and maintain connections to our databases. We can use them again to, to secure how we're connecting to our API, how we're building up our data source so that we're not revealing those, those, that information to our clients. And we can do it to maintain security, to maintain speed. And you can build custom web servers in whatever language you'd like. You can build them in, in Rust or in Go. You can build it in PHP or Python. You can build it in JavaScript um, or in Rust. I think I've said that one already. Or in Clojure. And then you have to deploy it. You deploy your custom server. You deploy your, your web app, your React app. And together they make the full experience. You're at this conference because you've heard of or are using Next.js. I think Next.js is great. We use it in our company for prototyping, for building at speed our clients' ideas to test with the users. I love its file-based routing and server-side rendering. But I think my favorite part of it is the API route. Any JS file that we place in our pages API directory gets transformed into a serverless function on deployment. That seems amazing to me. I've wrangled AWS lambdas and I've wrangled even Netlify functions that have been more challenging than that. Um, each of those serverless functions has a route based on our file name. And if you've worked in Express, then the style of the handler will be really familiar to you. We export the handler as our default function, which takes the request and the response object. Our handler may call out to other services. It's going to um, read the request and interpret any information sent with it. And then it will build out our response and send it back to our client. The response object has a lot of helper functions that are, will also be familiar for anyone who's worked with Express before. We can set the status, we can send a JSON response, we can send a string, we can redirect. And the file-based routing means that we can use the URL path to extract parameters that we can use in our code. Like in normal page routes, square brackets are used to represent dynamic routes. Getting these API routes deployed to Vercel is as straightforward as running Vercel or Vercel-prod. It's not a new project. 
Let's see how to migrate one class of use cases from our custom web server, built in Express, to our next API route. What I have here is a create next app, very simple app, which has our pages directory and some of the default routes that are built in. I've created this server. This server is just made up of three libraries at the moment, .env, Express, and Nodemon. Nodemon restarts my server every time I, I save the files. In my server file, I import and instantiate the Express and set up a simple route which logs the request and sends a response back to the client. I then listen and port 8080. So let me start my server and get my API client. So when I make a get request to port 8080 slash status, I get my response all fine here and the request is correctly logged in the console. With the Express helper methods, I'm able to change the status I'll do various other changes to the response as before I send it back to the client. I want my server to be able to access secure keys. And so I use the .env library, which allows me to create a .env file in the root of my server and to add some key value pairs there. In this case, I've got secret API key and this is my secret API key in my server. To be able to access these, I use require.env.config which gets all of the variables in my .env file and adds them to my process.env object. Now I can console log my process.env secret API key and everything will work just the same without my client knowing anything about that key, even as I interact with it. How do we do that with the next API routes? It's actually much more straightforward. I'm going to create a .env file on the root of our next project, just saying the same thing now. And I'm going to create a new file in pages api status.js. This file is going to export a default function handler. You can call this handler whatever you'd like. I'm going to use the word handler, which will take the request and the response. Now, this will, will automatically have my .env files when I start my server. So I can console.log process.env.secretapi key. And then I can return the same response back to my server. I haven't had to import um, .env um, because Next knows that to look there. I'll start my Next server and then get my um, API client. First of all, I'll just check my 8080 route's definitely not working. It's not. So 43000 slash status doesn't do anything. It gives me a 404, but API slash status does indeed say it's really fine and logs my secret key to the console. The client knows nothing about it but I have access to it in my code. That might feel like a little bit of a trivial example, but what it demonstrates is that we're able to access APIs securely. We're able to have secret information in our servers, which isn't interacting with the client. And we can do that just through next API routes. We don't need to introduce another server layer. We don't need to do anything else apart from use it in that way. In fact, for these use cases where we're maybe querying an API for some data and just straightforward and doing something quite basic with it, this would be a perfect use case for get server side props, which are only evaluated on the server and so can access those process.end files. Let's look at another example. This time, let's think about databases, how we can connect with those and how we can persist and use those connections in a serverless environment. Now my server has a bit more functionality to it. First of all, we're able to parse JSON using the Express middleware built in. And second of all, we've added some database functionality, um, which we are defining in our utils.db file. We're using MongoDB for our database, and specifically I'm using Mongoose to help with my models and my validation. So I'm going to require Mongoose, and I'm going to require my model, which is going to be for a user, which I'll talk about in a second. And then I have my connect database function, which is returning um, the mongoose.connect helper function using my um, URL and also um, some deprecation flags to no let my version of Mongo know that I know what I'm talking about and things that it doesn't need to use anymore. Um, I'm then going to um, sort of group together my models because I might use more, more than one model, I'm likely to use more than one model, and then I'm going to export those. Let's look at my model now. I'm using Mongoose again. 
and I'm defining my schema. My user schema is a new Mongo schema, which is my username, which is of type string, unique and required. My email, which is also of type string, unique and required. My age is a number, but it's not required. I've got a timestamp, which is true, and I want to strictly adhere to this schema. So my user is a model called user, and it uses that schema, and I'm exporting that. So back in my server file, I imported this connect DB function from my choir utils DB. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have that function run. And then when it's finished, when my database has been connected to, then I will start my application. Next, I'll look at the three routes I've defined. The first one is slash users, which is going to return all of the users that are stored in my database. Let's test out my API client, and you can see I have one user, which I've already defined from, pre from, from testing previously. The second route I've defined then is my post route on, this, on users, um, and that's going to create my user. So if I don't send the JSON body, I'm going to return an error. Otherwise, I'm going to create using that JSON body, return the error if there is one, otherwise send back the new created object. So let's do that. Let's create a new user. I'll bring up my schema to remind myself of what I need. So I need a username. So let's have nextconf as my username. I need an email. So let's have next at conf.net as my email. And I need an age. This is the first nextconf. So our age is going to be zero. I'll post that. And now we'll get the returned object with a timestamp and an ID. Awesome. If I try to post it again, I'm getting an error because I already have a username called nextconf. And if I try to post without an email, I'm going to get another error which is saying a validation error that I don't have an email and that that's required. The third route I have defined is user slash username where I can get the individual username object. So let's get the nextconf object by getting on um, forward slash users forward slash nextconf. And you can see I do get that user object back. Let's see how we do this with next API routes. The first thing that we notice is that in our connect database function, we have this line if mongoose connection ready state is not equal to zero return. We're in a serverless environment. And so we don't know whether or not our current instance has actually spun up a mongoose connection. If it hasn't, we're going to connect. Otherwise, we're just going to return because there's already an active mongoose connection in the instance. The next thing that we need to change is in our models. Specifically, when we return our model. Previously, we just returned mongoose.model user user schema, where it compiles the user model against the user schema. The problem is that in our serverless environment, we don't know whether or not that's happened already. We can't assume it has happened. And if it's happened once, we're not allowed to do it for a second time. So we have a try catch where we try to return the model. And if that doesn't exist, then we compile the model. And we need to do that for each of our models before we return them. Let's have a look at the API folder that, and the changes that have happened in there. I've introduced a few new files. I have users folder. And in that folder, I have an index.js file and a username.js file. Now, what I can't do is have a file called users.js at the top level and a folder called users. So that's why I have this index file. When I call API users, I'll get the index file. When I call API users something else, I'll get the username file. Let's have a look at our index.js file. The first thing we'll do is we'll export our handler function, and then we'll test to see what type of method we're dealing with. So if the request is a get method, we'll connect to our database. And then our code is exactly the same as the code we used in our Express server. Let's test that in our API client. We can see we're getting all of the users that we would expect to get based on our database so far. Let's look at our post route now. Again, we're connecting to a database. If there's no body, we're returning an error. Otherwise, we're creating with the body and returning any error to the client. So just confirming that works as normal. We'll have our new username. We'll have our new email address. And we'll have our, our age. Remember, that's not required. So you can have, we can have that with or without this. That was successful. And if we try to post again, we'll get an error because we already have a user with that email and username. Let's have a look at our dynamic route square bracket username now. Here, I'm going to again export my handler function. 
I'm going to connect to my database and then I'm going to use the variable that I'm getting from the query parameter to be able to search for the username of that name. The code's identical to what I was using for my Express server. When I return, I get my user object. When thinking about um, Next API routes, it's the serverless nature of them that causes the changes to most of the code that we're having to make. With an Express-based server, we have the benefit that our connection to our database is established on startup, that our models are compiled on startup. With a serverless environment, we are not sure when we hit a route whether or not the connection has been established and the routes and the models have been compiled. And so we have to use try catches, we have to check variables, we have to put in these guards to make sure that we're not over connecting to our database, to make sure we're not trying to recompile things that have already been compiled. But apart from that, all of the functionality is almost identical. We can use that same JavaScript that we used in our Express routes to be able to serve our next API serverless routes. The last example I want to look at has to do with authentication, specifically um, JSON web tokens. I'm not looking at um, logging in and logging out so much here, although that does come into some of the example. Let's look at how we can use Auth0 capabilities to be able to protect API routes. We'll look at both the server-based approach and the serverless-based approach, and we'll see some of the ways that they differ. I'm going to add some authentication to my server now. I've got a utils auth file, and I have a function called check JWT. And that's using um, Auth0's functionality, um, specifically their J JSON web key service. Um, to be able to interact and to be able to get a valid user token. Back in my server file, I check whether or not it's valid. And if it is valid, then um, the things pass through here. So let's check it without the check WT function. So we can see that works fine. I'm able to um, get access to the data and see it all fine here being reported back to the console. If I add the check WT in, um, I'm going to see that it's unauthorized. There's no authorization token found. Um, normally, we'd have some kind of handshake to be able to prepare the token, to be able to authenticate whether or not our user has it. In this case, I'm just, I'm just for ease of testing, I've introduced this get token route, which is just returning an access token. I'm going to copy that access token and put it into my in my auth in my client for bearer token. I'm going to place it in there, and now when I access my status token route, I get the right message. So how do I achieve this same functionality if our next uh, JS routes? So the first thing I'm going to do is going to use an Auth0 tool called Next.js Auth0. And this provides me with a whole load of functionality um, to be able to help out. It's mostly cookie based. So this is a slightly different approach, but it's going to um, show that what we just achieved is possible um, using Next API routes. I'll access the API slash login route, which will bring me to my Auth0 universal login page. And I'll use a test client that I've set up previously to log in. And that will redirect me back to my app. So heading back to the status route that I created before, I can see if I hit API status, I get it's a fine here. Now, I can also protect routes. I'm going to import my Auth0 that I set up earlier. And I'm going to export my default auth0.require authentication function. And I'm going to pass my handler function through that. I'm not going to export that as default, the handler function. So I'm going to delete that. Now, when I hit API status, I am unauthenticated. Because this is a cookie based authentication, I'm going to go back to my client and find the local host um, key value that was created when I logged in. Now I'm going to add a new cookie in my um, API client. I'll set the domain to localhost, the key to AO colon session, and I will um, get the value as it was set. 
Now I'll save my cookie and retry my API status. And I get my response back as I hoped. So um, there are three examples of ways that you can move from having a custom server to having a next API route. I think they cover most of the migration path. If you're looking at a library that you want to use in an express API route, it is possible that the documentation that is provided with the library isn't up to date yet or doesn't consider a serverless type approach. Hopefully some of the considerations that we've addressed in this talk will help with that. Hopefully you'll be able to think about those things about being serverless, about using the secrets, about when get server-side props might be useful, about whether or not there are libraries available that, are be that you can leverage. At SpinUp, we work really hard to only build the things that are adding value to our clients. So we'll leverage those third-party uh, libraries and applications as much as we can where they're relevant and build the things that we need to build that are going to allow our clients to get the most value as possible. I started by asking you, are you deploying too much, more than you need to? Can you replace some of your custom servers with some API routes that are serverless and are deployed in a much more straightforward fashion? I hope I've answered that question and give you some food for thought. I'm sticking around afterwards to be able to answer any questions you might have now. Otherwise, please um, connect with me on Twitter um, or read my blog or join my newsletter. I'd love to um, know how you're using API routes in your environment. What are the sticking points? How are migrations helping or not helping you? Um, and if we can help, um, either myself or my company, then please let us know. Reach out. Thanks for having me. Bye.